like if you're a landlord and you put a your rental property in an LLC, yep. but that LLC has no bank account um, or a bank account with zero dollars in it, and the homeowner's insurance on that property is in your personal name, not in the LLC's name, a court is going to disregard that LLC because it has no assets. You can't just put stuff in an LLC, give the LLC no assets, and then when you get sued, go, well, it has no assets, so you can't sue me. Yep. They'll just say, well, we're just gonna pretend that doesn't exist. Oh, yeah. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Break It Down with Braden. I'm super excited. I've got my good buddy on here, Paul Middlestad. Paul, thanks for joining me today. Oh, no problem at all. Thank you. Um, Paul is uh, actually a 2030 member uh, with myself. And uh, Paul, how long have you been a member with me? Four years. Four years. Um, And he's jumped in. He's been very involved, been on the board for a couple years now. Um, He's got an awesome family, wife Bailey, son Otto, daughter Poppy. Um, Just great people. And it's been awesome to kind of get to know you over the years since you've joined the club. And it's kind of where we've kind of stemmed our friendship, I guess. And, Absolutely. Uh, been golfing a little bit together lately and uh, just kind of doing some networking and stuff with some business together and just kind of been fun to learn a little bit about kind of what you've got going on in the Valley. Yeah, for sure. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're a partner in your law firm. and Yeah, I'm a partner at Zom Zerlich and Mac. Uh, we're a full service business, business litigation, business formation law firm. My niche is sort of professional liability in real estate. So we'll do anything from real estate, from zoning and entitlements through an eventual lawsuit when you build the place and if people that move in don't like it uh we can also help with anything engineering architecture all that kind of stuff so Very cool. anything real estate or real estate adjacent pretty much and you get so many calls that you guys are actually like the representative for the hotline correct right so Tell we me a little bit about that we represent uh the arizona association of realtors uh they have a legal hotline that's available five hours a day five days a week we have a, an attorney on that hotline live for all of that time every day. And any designated broker that's a realtor in the state can call in and ask any legal question they like. And we can give them some advice, uh, lead them in the right direction, try to resolve some disputes, uh, that kind of thing. So it's uh, heavily utilized. We get between 20 and I think the record is like 46 calls a day. Jesus. So uh, it's, it's, it's quite an undertaking, but uh, I think we do a pretty good job at it. Yeah. Uh, Give me some examples of some of the calls you've gotten recently. Oh, we get all kinds of things. The most common stuff is, you know, should my buyer or should my seller disclose this thing about my property? And the answer is always, well, if it was important enough to call me, the answer is yes, disclose it Um, it, with some very limited exceptions. So that's by far the most common thing. Uh, Right now in this market, we have a lot of questions about, um, you know, my seller is under contract for a million two. Um, they just got an offer at a million four in a backup position. How do I get out of the first contract? Yep. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, unless the buyer really messes this up, you're probably not going to get out of that. And before your seller decides to just cancel the contract anyway, maybe they should call a lawyer and talk to them about it. You know, maybe you as a real estate agent are not the person that should be giving them that legal advice. So. It doesn't work out great. Uh, it's very common right now. So we're very busy. Um, turns out as things get hotter in the real estate market in the Valley, uh, people make more mistakes. Yep. So we represent a lot of brokerages, a lot of agents. Uh, when things don't go exactly the way they should, and even when things go the way they should, but everyone gets upset anyway, and then you end up with a ADRE complaint or a lawsuit or what have you. So. A lot of the East Coast states, they require you to have an attorney to write the actual contract whenever you're purchasing a property. Correct. Arizona doesn't require that. So I'm assuming we're having a lot of errors coming up. Yeah. And right now you have the Arizona Association of Realtors form contract, which has been reviewed by judges a thousand times. We know what's in it. We know how to interpret it. Um, Contract interpretation when you just kind of go off on your own and start messing with things uh, can get a little bit weird. The judge has to determine what was the intent of the parties, which then you have to go back through everybody's emails and testimony and everything else. It just gets really messy. Um, And right now, everybody wants to waive inspections, waive appraisal contingencies, waive financing contingencies, even though the contract is financed. And inevitably, that leads to disputes. And we're seeing also a lot of... uh, 
sellers taking the opportunity to kind of cash out the equity in their homes without a real plan for what they're going to do after they don't have a house, yep. which ends up with a post-possession agreements, which almost never work. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we only really see the transactions that go completely sideways, yep. but a lot of those are pre- and post-possession agreements that just get really, really messy. Um, bringing that up, what are, what are kind of some guidelines and stipulations you kind of put in a contract for post-possession agreements? We'd recommend you don't do them. Okay. I mean, that's pretty much <laughs> our easy, position. Easy you know, we understand that we're kind of in an ivory tower as far as we can tell you what best practices are. Best practices aren't necessarily the best way to make money. Yep. Um, and we get that. But it is so messy to try to figure out a post-possession agreement that goes sideways. We've never been able to or or really even considered doing like a form for that just because there's so many different loopholes there, that there's a out. million things that can happen yep. you'd have to address so many different things um it's not to say it's never been done but when you have a situation with really explosive price growth and a post possession it's just hard to get the person out yep. and, you know they can they can make your life as a buyer miserable um if they just don't leave um you know they Evicting somebody in a post-possession agreement is extremely difficult and takes time. And so if they want to make it hard, they can make it hard and then leverage that into letting you keep the house or reducing the purchase price or whatever else, even though they're in the wrong. And you could go fight it for six months if you want to, yeah. um, and you should, but it's expensive and there's no guarantee you're going to ever get those attorney's fees back or that time back either. So, Yeah, I've learned that that's kind of the more so the case now is it's the liability as opposed to or not, not much. Wow. Let me try that again. It's not much as the liability of having the renter in there after the post possession, but it's actually them just not leaving the property. Right. And you can't in Arizona, there's no self-help. So you can't just go grab them by the ear and change the locks. Right. That would be assault. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you have to go through the Arizona Residential Landlord Tenant Act. Your seller is now your tenant, and they have all the rights that a tenant has. And so you have to file a forcible detainer action in justice court. They'll set a hearing for maybe a week from now. And if that tenant comes in with any kind of excuse, they'll set another hearing for a few weeks after that. And if they want to continue that for any good reason, you know, they can stretch that out a couple months. And then eventually you'll get a hearing. You go in. That hopefully the justice of the peace sees your side and you haven't screwed something up. And yeah. that's the other thing. As a buyer, you're probably not an experienced landlord, so you probably have screwed something up. You've right. probably breached the lease somehow. And now you have this tenant in there that you can't get out. And even if you do get the order to get them out, now you have to go get the constable to get out there and actually remove them. And right now they're way backed up. And so it just it becomes a nightmare. Like If you don't want to sell your house now, just wait, yep. it's much easier than dealing with all that. We've got a lot of friends that are in that same situation right now where they didn't do a post-possession, but they went and just rented a place, and right. they're doing month to month, and they don't know where they're going to go now. And now they've almost gotten priced out of their old house, that they, old house that they sold four months ago. Yeah, hopefully they got enough cash out of their deal that they can do that sort of indefinitely. But yep. uh, yeah, no, it's a real problem. People, yeah. are, people are having issues. And there's nothing to rent. I mean, it, there's you know there's some people, we have clients that are have been in hotels for months because yep. they just there's nothing out there. Yeah. Um, we were talking over the weekend about uh, a friend that Jeff uh, that's got his house on Airbnb. And it's just crazy the numbers that he's getting right now because people are in circumstances where they have to go rent somewhere and there's nothing to rent. Right. So they're in short term rentals, yep. even though they want to live in the valley. Yeah, it's, it's just nuts. So, yeah. Yeah. Where do you uh, see the general market going? I think it's pretty stable right now. Um, you know, we're not getting a lot of calls on the hotline about short sales and foreclosures, which, you know, that's always a, a bad indication. You know, in two th if you look at our stats from 2007, 2008, you could kind of see it coming. Yep. Um, we're not getting as many calls about just these insane indicators of a super hot market either, though. Like we had a call about a contract, they actually wrote this on page eight in the blank space in the contract, which you should just leave alone if you have the option. Um, they offered, and the, and the seller accepted, to do a block party for the entire block for the seller with a taco truck and a margarita machine for their whole cul-de-sac as a going away party if they would accept this buyer's offer. And the seller ended up accepting the buyer's offer, yep. and then 
the buyer realized that it's not actually legal to set up a margarita machine in the <laughs> middle of a public street. And so now we have a breach of contract. And it's like, <laughs> we're not seeing things that are quite that insane now. Um, so I think things are going to level off. I don't see huge price reductions coming unless interest rates go way up. Yep. But the effective rate is going to be basically the same if interest rates do go up. Like I think you'll see prices come down, interest rates come up, and your mortgage payment's going to be about the same. So at least for now. Yep, I agree. Um, kind of where things are right now, do you see kind of a, a shift with – home building and like subcontractors and stuff or do you where do you kind of see that kind of things going i it looks like at least from what i can tell trying to get an addition done to my house is they're busy yeah. they're super busy inventory is going up it seems like most of that work though is getting done in the you know 400 to six hundred thousand dollar range you know there's some custom homes getting built but they're not on spec for the most part although yeah. i do have some clients that are doing that and are still being very successful at it. Um, it seems like those subdivisions, though, that are going up quickly are just getting snapped up by investors. It uh, doesn't seem like a lot of that's even reaching the retail market. So um, at some point, these investors are going to want to offload these houses, and I'm interested to see what, what's going to happen when that happens. Yeah, and I guess with <coughs> supply and everything of, of um, products and stuff, are you seeing subcontractors having issues and stuff? Like you're getting calls from builders that are, you know subcontractors aren't coming through with their contracts and stuff like that? We're getting – so we haven't seen a huge uptick in construction defect litigation, yeah. um, but it's always been kind of high. I mean, that's kind of the bread and butter of certain law firms in the Valley is suing subcontractors and, yeah, and, just and developers. The just, fact that, like, hey, you built that, get you're getting right sued. Now. Yeah, or yeah. that too. Um, we are seeing a lot of – interest in people who are under contract on unfinished like tracked homes wanting to get out of the contracts because they're driving by the house while it's under construction and they're going that's all wrong um so i think they're having trouble getting good labor uh having trouble getting the right materials and having to cut corners as a result yep. in order to hit those benchmarks that are in their contract if you look at your average builder contract there's nothing in there for the buyer. It's basically, the builder's job is to build a house that is similar to what's in the contract documents within two years. Okay. But that's where it's becoming an issue with all these supply chain problems. They're running into where they're not going to be able to finish in two years. That's kind of so what I was getting they're at. They're yeah, scrambling. It's, yep, got um, so it's like the one out the buyer has, and it's like the first time developers have actually been running into, you know, that two years isn't intended to be like a, oh, we just made it. It's yeah. supposed to be like, wow, we have so much time. There's no way we're going to breach this contract. And, you know, when you can't get plywood, there's no way to finish the house. So yep. there's been a lot of stuff that's just been sitting out. And then the amount of rain we had this summer has been a real issue, too. I mean, contractors lost a month of activity this summer because of all the monsoon rain versus last year. So, Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I assume you got tons of calls after that. Yeah, well, and... When it rains, you know, 35 days, people start to realize their roofs aren't quite as watertight as they thought. So we're getting a lot of calls about, uh, you know, mold and, and water damage as well. That's been very common this year. Yep. yep. Yeah, I've got uh, Kyle and um, uh, Tyler coming in a little bit to interview as well. And uh, I assume Kyle's just been bombarded with the amount of oh, I'm sure, mold yeah. remediation and stuff they've been working on. Yeah, it's busy. And it's a popular thing for litigation, too, because it's sort of an unsettled area of science. You can make a mold infestation seem much worse than it actually is because everyone's just kind of scared of mold. Yep. Um, it's not all terrible, but some of it is. Um, we were talking a little bit this morning about uh, we've got a friend that um, doesn't have her business necessarily incorporated the way that you would structure it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you had some um, advice for her and different recommendations of which way she, she should incorporate her business. Um, I thought that was kind of insightful and also just didn't really – I don't really know of those things myself. What are kind of your favorite things that you like to work with your clients on? I know you, you mentioned a couple things already, so but – my thing is, if you're going to be running a business of any kind, yep. uh, you, you buy a rental, you're going to be a landlord, you are a real estate agent, uh, you're a real estate brokerage, whatever you're doing, your economic activity should be done in some kind of limited liability capacity, whether that's a corporation, a C-corp or an S-corp, an LLC, PLLC, depending on what you do. Um, you can even do LLPs or LLPs. There's all different kinds of limited liability entities. Yep. But... 
if you don't want your customers to take your house if you screw something up, you need to have that limited liability protection and have it insured and capitalized correctly. So like if you're a landlord and you put a your rental property in an LLC, yep. but that LLC has no bank account um, or a bank account with zero dollars in it, and the homeowner's insurance on that property is in your personal name, not in the LLC's name, a court is going to disregard that LLC because it has no assets. You can't just put stuff in an LLC, give the LLC no assets, and then when you get sued, go, well, it has no assets, so you can't sue me. Yep. They'll just say, well, we're just going to pretend that doesn't exist. Um, so put the money in the LLC that should be in the LLC, get insurance to cover what you think a reasonable, you know, what's going to happen at your property, right? Someone might slip and fall and hit their face in the counter and have a $100,000 uh, bill. Yep. Maybe you get... $500,000 in coverage. I don't know. Um, it depends on the size of the house, depends on what your tenants are doing. You know, if you have a tenant who's the best brain surgeon in the world, probably get better insurance. Uh, so, but it's important to not just be a sole proprietorship because then your whole life is just open for the taking. If you, something happens in your business, every asset that you own personally is now fair game in a yep. lawsuit, um, which is not where you want to be. So I work with a lot of real estate agents. Yep. So what would be your advice for them? Do a PLLC. Okay. Um, it, you know, talk to your tax professional too. And there's some tax liability stuff that gets brought up. It's not necessarily for every single agent. Okay. I would say the vast majority of agents should have their own, you know, independent contractor agreement with their brokerage set up as a PLLC. Um, that's almost always a good idea. Um, you don't have to, but it's probably smart. As a licensed professional, though, as a real estate agent, it would have to be a PLLC. So you still are going to be personally liable for your professional errors. So if you, you know, are representing a seller and the buyer says, you know, are you aware of mold in this house? And you as the listing agent are very well aware of the mold. <laughs> and you say, no, I, I, no, what, what no, mold? What no, mold? no mold. <laughs> <laughs> and then they find out that you there is mold. That's going to be a professional liability issue, which is going to open you up to personal liability okay. regardless. So lawyers, architects, real estate agents, engineers, anybody really with a professional license, you're not allowed to avoid that personal liability for professional errors, which is why you need E&O insurance. Um, you know, get, make sure your brokerage has professional liability insurance. Yep. We're looking at... Right now, we're not aware of any insurance product that is sold to individual agents. Uh, they really only sell to brokerages. Yeah. Um, but it looks like some companies are trying to figure out how to do that. The underwriting becomes really difficult because every agent does everything a little bit differently. Right. So, um, but if that ever becomes a reality, you, know, you may be able to get kind of an umbrella coverage. You know, If you think your brokerage's coverage isn't quite up to par or you don't like how much the deductible is, you may be able to get your own coverage soon. Yeah. We'll see. Um, so every time we talk, you have some crazy story of something that you're, you're dealing with right now or something. What's, what's your favorite story that you've kind of got for us? Here's something kind of interesting. You, there's a house, right? And I think this was, it was somewhere not in the valley, somewhere out in one of these sort of semi-ghost town areas, yeah. old mining town. Yep. So there's a house, and the buyer doesn't know this, but the seller is very well aware of it, and the whole town knows that that's a haunted house. Right? Okay. <laughs> there were newspaper articles like in the 70s saying this is a haunted house. You know, everyone knows this is a haunted house. Is it a haunted house such that you have to disclose that? Is that a material fact about the premises at this point that is going to affect the value? And that there, you know, do you need to tell the buyer that, hey, everyone in town thinks this place is haunted except you? Do we need to tell you that so that, you know, you're walking into this transaction fully informed? Yep. I mean, obviously, if you go to court, there's no judge that's going to go, well, yes, there's definitely spectral activity in that home and that should be disclosed. <laughs> but, you know, is the surrounding community's perception of this home as haunted enough where you have to disclose it? Right. And of course, the answer was, well, you know, if you had to call me, then 
Yeah, you should probably disclose yeah. it, you know, just to avoid a lawsuit. You, you might win. You probably would win. But who knows? But there was a case in New York where a guy had a house that he believed was haunted, seller. He was giving, like, tours of the house as a haunted house. So he had marketed it to the public himself as a haunted house. The buyer then sued him because he didn't tell the buyer that it was a haunted house. And the court found that the seller was stopped, so prevented from saying that the house wasn't haunted because he had said in the newspaper before that it was. So you can't come out now and say, well, Your Honor, that's ridiculous. It can't be haunted. There's no such thing because he was the one who created this sort of stigma around the house in the first place. Yep. So the court found in New York, as a matter of law, the house is haunted, period. <laughs> So the instruction to the jury was, you must consider this house to be haunted. And the jury came back and said, well, yeah, if it's haunted, then he had to disclose it. So you know, the, the buyer got a bunch of money because of the reduced value, because the seller at least put in everybody's mind that it was haunted. So in this case, I think it was in Bisbee. In this case in Bisbee, this, it wasn't the seller that created the stigma. Yep. So we're really not sure. It's one of those things, well, you, know, you could go to court and find out or uh, just disclose it. And yeah. hopefully the buyers kind of chill with your haunted house. So it was uh, that's an interesting one. That's about as interesting as real estate. I was going to say, that's pretty interesting. So case in point, if you uh, need to call an attorney to disclose something, just disclose it because chances <laughs> pretty are. Pretty much. Yeah. There's a few <laughs> things, you know, there's very few things that a lot of buyers would find important that you don't have to disclose. Uh, death in the house, um, someone with HIV is previously lived in the house, you don't have to disclose, you actually can't disclose those things. Um, that's kind of it. Pretty much anything else about the property that you think a reasonable buyer would find to be important and affect the amount they would pay for it, yep. you gotta tell them. Uh, and there's usually no downside. I mean, most buyers are pretty reasonable. Um, and in this market, you know, you lose your buyer, you'll have another one tomorrow anyway. So yep. just, dis yeah, exactly. just disclose it. Because you're going to spend, you know, if you get sued for non-disclosure, you'll refer it to your E&O, but most brokerages, deductible is five or $10,000. And that, in most brokerages, gets put on the agent, whether the agent's right or not. And then your E&O is going to pay at least twenty thousand dollars to deal with this and even if you win it's a negligence claim versus a contract claim so you as an agent you could go to court and have a jury unanimously decide in your favor in 30 seconds because it's the stupidest claim ever and you don't get those fees back so your you know coverage goes up and you still have to pay as the agent a ten thousand dollar deductible even though you're completely right it's nice to be right, yep. but it's better to just not get sued. So uh, just you know, if you think it's important. <laughs> well, Paul, thank you very much for coming on today. I uh, really appreciate you having on. Uh, for anybody that has any real estate questions, contract questions, anything, uh, what's a good number to reach you? Yeah, give me a call anytime, 623-250-2087. Awesome. Um, and like I said, uh, Paul is a partner at his law firm, uh, does amazing work out there. So if anybody has any questions, uh, any contract questions or uh, just any sort of uh, real estate questions. He's a great resource to use. Um, again, thank you for joining us for another episode of Break It Down with Braden, and stay tuned for another episode. Thanks, guys.